Uh, good afternoon. Hi there, if you joined us at 12 o'clock. Uh, apparently I was on fire, but unfortunately we had some te technical difficulties. So I am very much hoping that this is going out live. That's uh, fantastic. Welcome, welcome. My name is Sean Dooley. I am the National Public Affairs Manager from BirdLife Australia. And welcome to this eighth Birding at Home Facebook Live um, uh, series. It's really hard to believe it was eight. I'm, uh, I did the first one and it's really hard to think that was eight weeks ago. But that is life at the moment. It, it was eight weeks ago, eight days ago or eight years ago. It, it all kind of blurs into one. But in the eight weeks since we have updated the technology, which I have managed to somehow have not been able to master this afternoon, but we're good to go now. And we've had some great talks from BirdLife staff and friends of BirdLife Australia about a range of topics. Today, we're focusing on one of Australia's most incredible birds, the lyrebird. We have two species of lyrebird in Australia, the superb lyrebird, which is the one that most people are familiar with, a truly iconic bird. Now that term iconic gets bandied around a lot with our wildlife, but when a bird actually appears on the 10 cent coin as it appeared on stamps and uh, the New South Wales National Parks logo, it's, it's genuinely iconic. And that stretches from the forests, the tall forests generally, and rainforest from just east of Melbourne, uh, all the way up through the Great Dividing Range into Queensland, just makes it into Queensland, where there is another species of lyrebird, the lesser known and slightly smaller Albert's lyrebird. Uh, Albert's lyrebird is found just on the New South Wales and Queensland border, uh, it pretty much in the sort of more tr subtropical rainforests. Uh, today we're focusing mainly on the superb lyrebird uh, and we're going to talk about a little bit about the, what incredible birds they are and some of their behaviours and hopefully dispel a few myths about the lyrebird because there is a lot out there. And also we're going to look at the impact that the recent bushfires have had on lyrebirds and other birds in their forest homes. And we're going to end up talking about what BirdLife Australia is trying to do to help the lyrebird and all these other species recover after the bushfires. So first off, let's get straight into what a superb lyrebird is. Now, they are pretty weird birds because they are actually a songbird. Uh, so they're, they're much more closely related to birds like robins and wrens and canaries than they are to the birds that they would look like. Uh, normally that you would think they were like, like pheasants or peacocks. And when the first European settlers arrived in Australia, they really could not get their head around the superb lyrebird. They were in the gullies and, and wet forests around Sydney and soon they were encountered, even though they're a fairly shy bird. But basically the early ornithology skins of specimens back to you know, London and Europe, and people had no idea what to make about these birds. And in fact, this is, if I can get this up here, this is one of the first images published of a superb lyrebird. And as you can see, when you've just got the dead skin of a bird that's been sent months earlier, uh, that was shot and sent, this, they got it and go, well, we have no idea how this bird operates. And so a lot of those early taxidermy specimens, they completely put them in uh, poses that were totally not how the birds would be in real life. And this one I love in particular, they've gone, obviously, it looks like a peacock, so it must use its tail like a peacock. And you can see it there, it's, um, it, it is uh, basically, you know, out on the o in the open, which is completely not what a lyrebird would do. Proud, proud as a peacock singing out to the world. Uh, of course, that's not how lyrebirds behave. And I will just show you this photo from Alex Maisie, who is from La Trobe University studying lyrebirds and, and is working with BirdLife Australia. Uh, and this is what a, a male lyrebird would look like normally. Uh, they don't tend to hold their, their um, tail up like a peacock. We'll see a video that Alex took later of what they do with their tail feathers. But you can see in that image that the long tail feathers, which gave rise to the lyrebird's name, uh, not as many people thought, and I certainly, when I first encountered lyrebirds when I was a kid uh, on a holiday with my parents in Marysville, which is a beautiful town just out of Melbourne up in the hills. And uh, 
unfortunately one of the areas that was really hard, severely hit by the Black Saturday bushfires in 2009. Uh, and I was staying at the hotel with my parents in Marysville and we could hear the lyrebirds ringing out with their mimicry, their famous mimicking song of other birds through the valley. And my parents told me that that's a lyrebird, it's pretending to be other birds as it calls. So uh, as with most people, I thought it was called a lyrebird, L-I-A-R not L-Y-R-E, which is named after the Greek instrument, the, the lyre, which is looks when the lyrebird's tail's held up, it, those feathers actually look like the lyre. So that's where it gets its name from, uh, not because it's mimicking, impersonating other birds. Uh, you also see in that image how it has honking great feet now the lyrebird uses those feet to rake through the leaf litter of the forest and it, it, it scrapes away the debris, the, the leaves, the, the, um, the small branches, things like that, looking for tasty treats, mainly invertebrates, often worms, but it, it will eat other smaller creatures as well. And so they are really powerful birds in, in terms of the amount of turnover of leaf litter in the forest, they almost, it's almost like they create their own compost bins and they go through them. And there's been some studies done that show that where lyrebirds are present in the landscape, the severity and impact of bushfires is far less because they're actually turning over the soil and composting that, that dead vegetation and creating a, a much wetter microclimate. Now, obviously when we have mega fires like we had after, um, over the last summer, uh, those areas will still burn as well if they're so dry. But there, there, a lot of studies show that lyrebird presence in a forest is actually aiding that forest in resisting bushfires or certainly the severity of the bushfires. Um, so they, the ma massive uh, you know, interest that comes up from lyrebirds is not only that they're beautiful looking, but also what they do vocally. And there's been a lot of research into the lyrebirds, but it's generally focused on these male lyrebirds. You can tell a female lyrebird because it has, uh, it doesn't have those large lyre-shaped feathers. It's, it's a bit more subdued. And people have, scientists over the years have focused on the behavior of the males, the mimicry, their display. They use that tail to do, throw it over their head like a, like a, a beautiful filamentous veil and that they dance for the females. And the focus has always been on that, but we're just discovering uh, how interesting uh, a life cycle and a life history the female lyrebirds have too. And there's an upcoming article in the June um, 2020 Australian BirdLife magazine where that focuses on some of the mysteries being unveiled about the female lyrebird's behaviour and it's every bit intri as intriguing as the males. And in fact, one of the things that people don't realise is that female lyrebirds are just as an accomplished mimic as the males. The, this research is showing, no one really knew why, but this, the new research is showing that um, one of the reasons is that the females have to raise their chicks by themselves. Those male birds who use the big feet to create a mound and uh, create that space, open space, basically a performance stage in the middle of the forest floor. And then they put on the performance. They spend most of their time sort of primping and preening and, and practicing their stagecraft to attract females with their, with their fitness through their song and their dance. That they don't actually help the female in the nest building or in any of the chick raising. So as the female only lays one egg a year um, it, and the chicks take a very long time to develop, they'll be in the nest for up to three months, which is really unusual for a songbird. So the, the females put a lot of investment in, in protecting that chick. And one of the, one of the uh, ways they do that is using song to basically, the researchers, researchers are showing that they use the song to warn off other females to keep out of their nesting territory, but also they use it, it really fascinatingly, I'm, I'm, I'm staggered about this, is they actually use their, their powers of mimicry to try and deter predators. And some of the research that's happening now is showing that the, um, they will use a different set of impersonations of birds. 
and other sounds to deter a different type of predator. So it probably is the case that not so much the males created mimicry, um, that it's, it quite, could be quite possible that the females drove the mimicry of other birds for, for the protection of the young, and then the males latched onto that and over millions of years, because these birds are ancient, uh, have an ancient lineage, they've developed these elaborate courtship rituals. And we, we've spoken about that. And I'll, I'll just I'll just get on to, if we can, if we can I will just show you the uh, what the rituals look like, what the, the mating courtship is. If we can see if we can lose that image and get onto this is this is what the male looks like when it throws over that veil of um sorry my mouse is sticking a little bit here there we go yeah so that, that's what the male looks like uh its head is actually under all that uh that white filament of feathers so it the lyre is at the back not stuck upright as you'd see in those colonial paintings and it throws its um, feathers forward and it does an incredible song and dance routine, which if we are lucky, we should be able to, yes, we'll, we'll go with that now. So I can't hear this, but I'm sure you can. This is the male uh, in sort of an area just near the Dandenongs in Victoria, but Alex Maisie took this footage. Try not to talk too much. You can hear the different bird calls that it's using. I've identified eight species of call of other birds and also a frog. And, uh, and I'm sure there's some that I've missed. Getting excited now. Here she comes, the female checking him out. Dancing action, ramps up. And she doesn't seem interested. Off she goes. Last effort now. She goes to check out another male live bird's display. And just gives one last final shimmy. And no luck today, my friend. Now that that display happens. Uh, it's not that the lyrebirds have a lek like other, other birds where they all gather together, but all the lyrebirds within the forest, all the males will have their territories and they will actually, um, they will all, and it's driven by female selection. As you can see there, the male, uh, she comes up and she checks out the male and she will do that with all the males in, in her territory. And it's really interesting that the male birds have two types of uh, mimicry song. They have one they use in the, uh, in the mating season to impress the females. And, and from what we understand, that is often very similar among birds in the same valley or the same area because the female wants to compare like with like. So, you know, you don't want to be recording some avant-garde noise that the female doesn't really get um, because she can't compare with, uh, with, with the, your neighbouring uh, singer. So, but during the off season, when it's non-breeding season, the males continue practicing their songs. And this is where you'll get them doing lots of songs, lots of impersonations of other birds and animals that you can't actually uh, see, uh, that, that, that you don't normally see in the, um, uh, in, in the mating season. And this is where we get all of these reports of lyrebirds doing human noises. It's a really, fascinating area of study. People uh, report anecdotally to us and, and over the years you hear of lyrebirds imitating all sorts of things. And of course, there's that famous footage of uh, in Life of Birds by David Attenborough of the lyrebird at the Adelaide Zoo doing impersonations of uh, jackhammers and things from a construction site and also the impersonation, the mimicry of the cameras back in the days when it was film camera and you would have not only the shutter and the click, but also the film winding as, uh, as the next shot came on. Really incredible. The, the jury is out as to how often lyrebirds imitate human noises in the bush, but the weight of anecdotal evidence is that they, they do indeed. And I, I have my own story with that. I was in Tara Bulga National Park in South Gippsland once, 
And what I thought was a young male lyrebird started doing a display on the track in front of me. We're in, the, in a gully and I couldn't work out what the sound was. It was very rhythmic. It didn't sound like anything I'd heard from a lyrebird. And it reminded me of the sound you hear from when you pull up at the lights and there's, you know, there's a young guy with his stereo cranked up and playing some techno music. It was kind of like, it was giving other bird calls, but underneath it was going and the really weird thing about that was it got louder and then softer and then louder again. And I really couldn't work out what was going on. And then I realized I heard a car drive past and the gully that we're in was below the road and the car would come louder and louder and then softer as it went up the gully. And then as it came back the other way, it would that noise would get louder again. So I actually believe that this bird was had heard enough subwoofers coming out of, uh, you know, potentially um, picnickers' cars that it was it had learned to interpret those and incorporate them into its subsong. Now I can't prove that, and a lot of times people are saying, "Oh my God, the lyrebird's giving a mobile phone call ring," but it's actually just their usual natural call as well because they do have their natural call. You heard that. Um, you heard that in that video that I showed, that, that sort of ringing two note call, that's actually the lyrebird's standard call. But uh, Alex Maisie has sent me this to say, you know, I was asking whether he knew of examples of whether the um, whether lyrebirds use human calls. Now, I won't be able to hear this when I play it to you, but we will listen and you tell me whether you, whether you can hear uh, whether this sounds like a live bird impersonating a, a human. <laughs> so I think at that first bit, it's now doing more bird calls. So we'll fit finish it there. Hopefully you could hear that. Um, we have in that, in that star, I, I swore that I could hear some like a human voice talking about rocket ships, rocket ship, rocket ship. Other people have interpreted that uh, as in somewhat more salty language. Um, but this bird basically is exposed to humans. It's, it's in Sherbrooke forest where there's a lot of picnickers and a lot of day trippers going. So obviously it would hear a lot of human voices, but the interesting thing when it's inter interpreting bird song, the birds have a, a regular call that it would hear often. And what was really fascinating in that sound grab that I played to, if you could hear it, was that the, it was also doing that, that high pitched shrilling tree, uh, uh, shrieking trill, that was a sooty owl call, which is a bird of the night. So obviously it's hearing that at night and incorporating it into its mimicry. But with human voices, we're always talking different things. We're saying different things. So unlike a parrot that you can teach to talk, you can only teach it with repetitive phrases. The lyrebird's probably not hearing those repetitive phrases so much, but whatever it was saying in that um, song that we heard, there was there was certain words that get repeated quite often that it seems to be beginning to in, incorporate into its um, into its its repertoire. Now I'm getting lots of questions coming through, which is fantastic. We'll answer those at the end. But I did just see a question pop up. Somebody was asking, at what age do the birds start to mimic? Well, I think. Uh, they start learning. It, it's, it's a really complex process and it takes many years before they master it. And we believe that female lyrebirds don't start breeding till they're about four or five years old. So their mimicry that they need to ward off predators and to uh, solve their territorial disputes with other nesting females, they, they probably take, it takes them at least four or five years to, um, to, to learn to a sufficient level. The male lyrebirds don't seem to actually establish territories and get to that breeding age until about seven years. So it's a long apprenticeship and lyrebirds can live for, for up to 20 or more years. And so they will continue to learn as they go and they will, they're actually fairly conservative in, in their repertoire, but they will incorporate over time new, um, uh, new sounds. And we know that because we have uh, lyrebirds in, 
incorporating introduced species into their um, into their repertoire. So in Sherbrooke Forest, for instance, the, all the lyrebirds tend to use blackbird calls, which is a bird that wouldn't have hit um, Sherbrooke until the late 19th century. We also know that the lyrebirds that were introduced into Tasmania uh, in the, I think it was in the 1920s or 1930s, that they still have traces of birds that are not found in Tasmania in their mimicry. Birds like red wattle birds. There's still elements of those calls in, um, in birds in Tasmania. So these birds have been there for 70 to 100 years, and yet there are still res residual uh, songs of Australian songbirds. So it is an incredible, incredibly difficult thing to learn, and it does take them many years to master. Uh, we'll keep moving on. What I want to go to now is the impact that the bushfires have had on lyrebirds. Lyrebirds are, even though they're, they're very cryptic, and in, except in a few places where they're used to humans, they're very shy. But they're actually a, quite a common bird. And, and here at BirdLife Australia, where our mission is to stand together to stop bird extinctions, we, we haven't focused in the past too much on studying lyrebirds. Uh, our bird data website, um, our monitoring system where all of our volunteers and our researchers go out and do bird surveys and then use bird data to record them so that we can analyse them. We have decades worth of, of monitoring in the forests where superb lyrebirds are. So we know where they occur and we know at what rate they're reported in the areas they occur. But we didn't have very many specific projects on the lyrebirds simply because they're actually quite a common bird, or they were. You might not see them very often, but all the, all the surveys show that they're actually very resilient and hardy species, and they generally do really well across most of their range. We know in certain areas they suffered from, particularly from um, the excess logging. Uh, you know, obviously you log the habitat, you open it up, uh, and logging, the clear felled logging then burns the habitat afterwards. So it makes it uh, totally unsuitable for, for lyrebirds for many years. So logging ha has obviously had an impact, but also in areas particularly near urban centres, uh, human habitation, we know that there's a high predation rate of foxes and dogs and particularly cats. And uh, the Sherbrooke lyrebird group have been working for over 25 years um, to try and bring back that fairly isolated population of lyrebirds. And the work they've done with the local council and with the Victorian Environment Department over the years has been really tremendous. And, and the numbers of lyrebirds has, has, I think it's tripled since the 1990s. And one of the key factors in recovering that population has been the cat curfew, has been a targeted uh, eradication of feral cats and foxes within the, within the forest, but also the local council in, in the Dandenong Ranges has implemented a cat curfew. You're not allowed to have your cats outside, and that has seen the predation rates of lyrebirds um, plunge and the population recover to a really healthy and vibrant population, which is great news. But across the range, we thought they were pretty safe until the fires began in probably September of last year. The first fires were further north and they actually impacted on the Albert's lyrebird, um, the, really concerning those fires that, that reached into Lamington National Park in Queensland and other places, started to burn rainforest habitat that we had never known historically to burn. And the mapping that BirdLife Australia has done over the, um, since the bushfires, where we've been able to take the work that we've done through bird data and we've been able to map the, where the fires went there and their severity against what we know is the distribution of, of the lyrebirds. We found a really concerning, really just tragic situation. The Albert's lyrebird only had 17% of its habitat burnt during these bushfires in the past year. The, the, its southern relative, the superb lyrebird, has absolutely been one at the forefront of destruction of habitat of, of all the birds in, in Australia that were impacted by the fires. And there are three subspecies of the, of the superb lyrebird. 
the, the most impacted was the central superb lyrebird, which is found in New South Wales. That's the one you get around Sydney. And that had 46.6% of its range burnt in, in the fires. The northern superb lyrebird had 40%, 40.55% of its habitat burnt. And the southern uh, subspecies of lyrebird, superb lyrebird, the one that's found in Victoria and southern New South Wales, that had 37.17% of its range um, impacted by the fires. Now we know from um, anecdotal reports, and, and we've all seen them and heard the stories, live birds incredibly for, for weak flyers are very capable of individuals surviving the worst of the bushfires. Uh, I know I was told a story from Black Saturday um, where uh, somebody's house in, uh, I think it was in St Andrews, uh, was, was, they had to flee the house as the flames uh, from the bushfire front started burning their house. And they raced down the back of their property and jumped in the creek to survive the flames. And as, as this inferno was going overhead and they were down in the creek, they looked to their left and they realised they were sitting next to a live bird that was sitting in, in the creek as well. And we saw over the... Um, during the Gosper Mountain fires, we saw that there was uh, that an amazing shot of, I think it was, there were 13 lyrebirds in, in the actual frame of the shot, all hanging around a dam in the middle of the smoke of the bushfire. And we spoke to the uh, person who took, the, took that image and she said that there were uh, something like, you know, more than 20 lyrebirds in that immediate vicinity at that time. And lyrebirds aren't that social a creature. So they knew when the fire front was coming to get to water. And we have reports of lyrebirds emerging from wombat burrows as the fire, after the fires had come through. And we're getting a lot of poignant images of the only bird in a burnt forest there being a lyrebird scraping through the still smouldering ashes, attempting to find some food. So we know that lyrebirds individually can survive fires, but with these enormous infernos that went through such vast areas, we're incredibly concerned at the, what the impacts for the long-term survival of lyrebirds and other forest birds are. So BirdLife Australia is undertaking, um, uh, we, we've got a, a bushfire recovery program. We're doing a lot of work from Kangaroo Island all the way through Victoria, New South Wales into Queensland through our volunteers and through our Woodland Birds program and our Bushfire Recovery program. One of the projects that we're embarking upon with La Trobe University is to look at the impacts of the bushfires on lyrebirds, on the superb lyrebird. And that project is involving getting out on the ground, looking and checking against the mapping that we have and seeing where lyrebirds have survived how severe the fire was, where the refuges are that weren't burnt that are still holding lyrebirds, and embarking on management plans to ensure that we can um, manage those refuges so that they're saved from future burning and also manage those areas so that the threats post a bushfire aren't going to have a detrimental impact on the survivors. One of the things we do know from bushfires is that Millions of birds will die in the flames, and we've all seen, all seen those harrowing images. But after the fire's gone through, the survivors are left in a barren landscape. It's very hard to find food, and it's extremely hard to find shelter to hide from predators. And the research that we know from the satellite tracking and the tagging of, of um, feral foxes and cats is that those predators are actually attracted to burnt areas. They can come from 30 or 40 kilometres away looking for a free smorgasbord after the um, after the fires have gone through. So we know that predation of, um, of the survivors is a real issue. And this study hopefully will be able to pinpoint uh, at, cr at critical times when the, when the predation pressures are, are too high and we'll be able to get in there and be able to eradicate the feral animals that are, that, that are killing our survivors. And also, uh, pinpointing things where the feral herbivores, things like deer that have survived, um, and deer are in huge numbers now in uh, southeastern Vic New South Wales and eastern Victoria. And they, of course, are going to be detrimental to the recovery of lyrebirds and other forest species because they are stripping um, the vegetation as it regrows and not allowing the forest to regenerate as it should. 
So it's identifying those things and, and looking at how if we try and protect the lyrebirds, we can protect all of the other species that were impacted by fire and that are trying to re-establish themselves as the forests return to green. So that work was only, uh, that project was only capable of, of being implemented because we, we got a very generous grant from a, a donor organisation. And we rely at BirdLife Australia on the donations from, um, from, from people like you, to be honest. Uh, BirdLife Australia has a vast support network of people who volunteer in our projects, but also who volunteer their money to, to donate uh, to, to the work that we do. And we, we basically, this, these fires, you know, you've heard this word a lot. You've heard the word unprecedented, an unprecedented amount of times in the last six months. But these truly are the, the scale and extent and severity of the fires we've been through in the past year are unprecedented in, in historic times and probably going back thousands of years. The area of forest that we lost to these fires is the size of England. And you don't recover from a blow that big. In, in traditional, people will say traditionally, well, Australia is a land of bushfires, but we never saw when the land was under indigenous management, that the fossil evidence shows, the, the pollen evidence, the, the burning, the, the vegetation map show, we never had fires of this extent. The fires might be severe in drought years and they might be large, but there were always areas, even within a fire scar, that, um, that were unburnt and from which birds like lyrebirds and other animals could repopulate as the forest regenerated. We have hundreds of kilometres of fire fronts that's gone through. It's going to take decades, decades for, for the forest to recover and for the birds, the forest birds and other animals to recover. And we need to expedite that recovery. And so the BirdLife Australia, we're in this for the long haul. And this Lyrebird project is, is a wonderful promising start at actually getting out there and doing something and helping aid this, this recovery. And we're working on with um, our partners on Kangaroo Island. We've been, had rapid assessment teams out there looking at what birds have survived and, and then how we can help them. And all of these projects, there's so much damage done, so much work to do, and we can't do that work unless we get your support, both in terms of being a volunteer and also donating to, um, to our project work, our program work. And the current mid-year appeal that BirdLife Australia is running is focusing on the work that we do with bushfire recovery. The, the, the money that will be donated uh, that you donate during this campaign is going to go to any number of projects that, that support our staff to help recover the bush, recover the forests and the birds that rely on them. Uh, the Lyrebird project is just one of many that, that we're hoping to implement in the next couple of years, but we can't implement them unless we have the resources. So, you know, we want to see these lyrebirds survive. We, you know, because they are truly incredible birds. Uh, just one of the, to, to be in a forest, and this is a great time to get out now that we're getting into lock, uh, out of lockdown, to actually be in a forest. And at this time of year, it's glorious because the male lyre birds are starting, they're scratching out their mounds right as we speak. They breed through winter. They, they have the courtship displays through winter. And we think that might be so that they're, if they did all their mimicry in spring, the female lyrebirds wouldn't know whether that was a golden whistler calling or a kookaburra calling or a male impersonating them. So the lyrebird mating season is throughout the winter. And if you are anywhere within a tall forest that's unburnt, um, anywhere sort of from uh, the Queensland, New South Wales border, right through the Great Dividing Range down to the Dandenong Ranges and places like Tulangi in, um, in near Melbourne, Go out into those forests and you will experience, even if you don't see the birds in display, you will experience one of the most wondrous sounds that you can ever experience. The, the call valleys ringing out with these incredible mimics, accomplished mimics. It's just something tremendous to do. So I'd highly recommend that you get out there and do that. So that's, uh, that's an introduction to the lyrebird. I'll just, while, while we, I take a few 
calls, uh, calls, take a few questions. I'll just show you, this is an image of the Albert's lyre bird, um, which we haven't really focused on. That's the sm slightly smaller member of the family. That's the male doing what's called a gronking display. Uh, they don't necessarily have mounds in the same way that lyrebirds, but they will often use a kind of collection of fallen vines. And as they sing and dance, they actually clank the, uh, the, the vines together and it kind of creates a rhythmic sort of um, accompaniment to their song. And it's almost like the uh, original uh, corroboree. It, it, it's an incredible thing to, to see and experience. Uh, so anyway, I'm my trusty team at BirdLife have been collating your questions and we I'm going to just scroll through a few and there's plenty there's there's really plenty that have uh, come up so um, so people have asked where where they can find a live bird as I said anywhere in the forests uh, in the Great Dividing Range essentially behind um, sort of well, not behind the Gold Coast all the way down to behind Melbourne they do they're not necessarily a rainforest species but they certainly do like rainforest gullies ferny gullies anywhere that has a good amount of leaf litter that they can rake through and they usually are associated with tall forests tall eucalypt forests like the uh, mountain ash forests and other places um, places like that um, we've had what age they learn to mimic and uh, I've got a question where the lyrebirds migrate. They don't migrate as such. As I said, they're not strong flyers, but they do move about and the ter territorial bonds tend to break down a bit in the non-breeding season. So after spring, throughout the summer, also as, thing, as the forest dries out, they, they will move further afield uh, looking for food. So they, but they generally, it's not like you're going to get them, you know, hundreds, moving hundreds of kilometres. It's much more a local dispersion. dispersion. Um, so, yes, uh, somebody's asked that, I mentioned that lyrebirds can help minimise the bushfire risk and were these fires uh, too hot for them to make a difference? And unfortunately, we think yes. Although having been into the forest the burnt forest uh, where the Gospers Mountain Fire was with one of our Woodland Birds project people, Mick Roderick, um, back in February. We spoke to a few locals. We only heard one lyrebird call in the, in the day that we were there, but we spoke to a couple of locals out there, including the woman who'd taken the photo of the, uh, of the dozen or so lyrebirds around the dam. And they were saying that lyrebirds were turning up at their houses in their, in their gardens, which had survived the bushfires. So, um, and when you looked out over that landscape, some areas, it was like a World War I battlefield. There was, there was not a stick of vegetation left alive, but there were other places where the canopy wasn't scorched. And there were other places where right down in gullies, especially in those sandstone gullies where you had lots of rock overhangs and, and things like that, where, Lyrebirds and other birds had survived, and there were even, you know, there's even tiny patches of unburnt ground. So um, perhaps those areas were aided by the lyrebirds being able to, you know, turn over that soil and they didn't burn quite as severely. So, um, but generally, when you get conditions like we had, years and years of drought, tinderbox dry with, with no moisture, no humidity in the air and those ma massive mega fires, um, and for even a lyrebird really struggles to, to do the Smokey the Bear Act and keep the fires out. Um, yeah, we, we've got lots of, lots of other questions. I realise we're, we're getting close to, to time. Uh, let's see, what, what other questions uh, I think we've got here. Uh, the... Uh, and just on that, actually, in terms of the fires and the impact of the fires, there was a, there was a really uh, important, hugely important federal court decision yesterday uh, in Victoria, brought, brought by the uh, friends of the Leadbeater's possum, and uh, run by our friends at the um, at, at the Environment Justice Australia organisation uh, who ran the case, and that was hugely important because it showed that the uh, the, the forestry practice in, practices in Victoria have not been complying with protecting threatened species. And we know this is happening in areas in Tasmania as well, where we have threatened species like swift parrots, and also in 
right now in southern New South Wales, there are areas of forest that were unburnt that are really important for so many birds, but particularly the critically endangered swift parrot, which flies over there, over here in winter. And those areas are now open for logging. And the pressures on logging areas that were unburnt is, it, it, it's just become so unsustainable that the damage that, that's been inflicted by these bushfires on birds like lyrebirds, if you then go in and log the remaining areas that haven't been burnt, if you log that unsustainably, if you do the clear felling, we know from studies of forest owls and lots of other birds that it takes decades for birds to repopulate those areas compared to areas with bushfires within 10 years, you can get you know, a, a decent recolonization of birds. So we have got to be really careful at the moment that post bushfires, we don't make the, mad make the situation worse. And BirdLife Australia is involved in, on a number of fronts, campaigning to try and ensure that our nature laws are actually strong nature laws that do what it says on the box, that actually protect our threatened species. There's no point having threatened species legislation that just allows other laws to override it and see the consideration of protecting those threatened species, stopping them coming extinct, become sec second place to other, uh, to other actions. So this, I can't emphasize enough how important this decision in the federal court was yesterday. And hopefully it, in the short term, it means that at least, I think it's 41 logging coops that had birds like lyrebirds and sooty owls, which has really been heavily impacted by these fires. And also mammals like, like the lead beaters possum and, and other things like greater gliders. The fact that they're now ha have a stay of execution and are hopefully protected from being clear felled and burned is really gives me some hope that we can tackle the enormity of the impacts of these bushfires. Uh, we will, uh, I'm not sure if we've got any more questions coming through. Um, I think that that might be it. So I will, uh, if I haven't answered your questions, please uh, get online to us and we can answer your questions. And please, I, I can't emphasize enough how, how we're at a critical juncture in, um, in Australian natural history. We are at a moment with, where we've had so much devastation from these bushfires that if we don't get the recovery right, we're going to see once common birds, once beautiful birds like lyrebirds uh, disappear from, from our large areas of our landscape. And we're seeing these lyrebirds uh, becoming potentially threatened species. We really don't want that to happen. BirdLife Australia is committed to making sure that we don't lose any Australian birds. And We've worked in the past on critically endangered birds, the birds that are just that far from extinction. And lyrebirds through these fires and through continued climate change are gonna see more of these sorts of fires and now becoming, uh, they're, they're now being they're the conveyor belt towards extinction. They've jumped on and that conveyor belt's getting faster and faster. And we don't want them going over the edge. So we really need your support to help with our campaigns, with our on-ground conservation work, working with our partners, working with landowners, and working with the scientists and, and government agencies to, to try and help these birds recover, help these populations recover. Because I know that being in a forest and having a live bird display, if, if you get that chance to see it, it is one of the most profound, beautiful, natural moments you can have. And I want that for my kids and my grandkids, and I want it for all Australians to, to experience. And I want, it, I want these beautiful birds that have survived for tens of millions of years to continue surviving into the future. So thank you very much for listening. I hope uh, we've blown a few myths about live birds out of the water. And I hope, I feel, you know, that, I hope that we've empowered you to feel like you can actually take some action stand with BirdLife Australia to prevent the extinction of the lyrebird and so many other species. Thanks again and uh, stay tuned next week for our next session of Birding at Home.